Thank you, Lord, for that wonderful promise. We know for a fact that it's going to happen, and we look forward to it. We pray, Father, now that you'll bless this gr gr great meeting today. Lord, you said it were two or more were gathered in your name, that you were there. We claim that promise. We ask, dear God, now that you'll fill your message with that which we need to make us better men and women in society, better Christians, but most of all, better witnesses that we might glorify you. Now, Lord, bless and have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now in your songbooks is 697, 697.
take our Bibles and go to Psalm 3, the third psalm. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, 
There is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head, mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. They have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. You may be seated. And turn your songbooks now to number 515, 515. Junior Church being dismissed also at this time, 515.
open to the book of Jonah, and let me jump ahead a little bit. Uh, Jonah lived during the time in the northern kingdom of a guy by the name of Jeroboam II. If you know anything about the Bible, you know that after Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split, and the southern kingdom and the northern king, you had Rehoboam and Jeroboam. This is a different Jeroboam. This is many years later, and they, call, they refer to him as Jeroboam II. And Jonah was alive during that time when Jeroboam II was king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And for both Israel and Judah, Jonah lived during a time of peace and prosperity. In fact, the kingdom of Israel expanded to a greater size. Only under Solomon's kingdom was it greater. So this was a time of peace and prosperity physically. But spiritually, Israel was on a downward slide. In fact, only 100 years, around 100 years, really probably less than 100 years after Jonah, Israel, the northern kingdom, went into captivity under the Assyrians because of their sin, because of their compromise with the pagan nations around them, because of their compromise with idolatry. Jonah, the book of Jonah, is not a fictional story. It's not an allegory. It's not a parable. It is an, a an account of an actual event. Jonah is mentioned one time in the other time in the Old Testament outside the book of Jonah. And I'm just going to quote that verse. That's 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 22. It says, he, talking about Jeroboam, he restored the coast of Israel from entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah. So Jonah was an active prophet in the nation of Israel at this time. So again, Jonah lived under the reign of uh, Jeroboam II. 
you know what? I missed one slide on my slideshow, and it was a question I have for you. It's a question I want you to consider, simply a question. How do you respond to the Word of God? That's the focus of the message from Jonah chapter 1 this morning. How do you and I respond to the Word of God? Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for your Word today, and God, thankful for the book of Jonah, thankful for what it teaches us. It teaches us about your love and mercy, even in the spite of many times our willful attitudes towards your Word. And God, I pray today that we would learn from Jonah as to how we should respond to your word, how we should respond to your revealed will in our lives. God, bless now. Open our hearts, open our minds to your words, Lord, to what you have to say. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you respond to the word of God? If you're open to the book of Jonah, you notice the first word is the word now. And actually, in Hebrew, a word that comes across in the beginning of Jonah is the word and, which is kind of a strange way to start out a book. If, if you're, some of you young people here, if you're writing a paper for your, for your teacher at school or at college, and you start the paper out with the word and, you're going to get marked down a point right off the bat. That's not a good way as far as when we're writing to start, start, out, a, start out a paper. But what it means in this passage is, is Jonah is just another part of God's continuing story of redemption. Jonah is another segment. So continuing on in God's story of redemption, continuing on in God's plan for the world, continuing on in God's plan for believers, and Jonah continues on in God's plan of redemption. I want to ask you a question that's sort of a side note, but it'll tie in either to this message or coming message. How do people respond when you say with confidence, boldness, assurance, when you say, I am on my way to heaven. I wonder this morning, can you say that? Can you say with confidence, I know that I'm on my way to heaven. People many times respond, if you say that, with kind of, you're kind of crazy. Why do they respond that way? They may know you very well, and they see your sins and your failures And they say, how could you know that you're on your way to heaven? Or they may know themselves very well, and they don't see how that you're any a better person than they are, and they don't think they're good enough to go to heaven. So they say, how could you know that you're on your way to heaven? They may also think that they're a pretty good person. But they might say, you know, I hope I'm going to heaven. I don't know that I'm going to heaven. And if there's anybody that's going to go to heaven, it's certainly not you. What do people often leave out of the equation in that kind of thinking? They leave out of the equation God's love, mercy, and forgiveness. The reason that I am going to heaven, if you're here this morning, the reason that you're going to heaven is not based on whether you're a good person or whether you're a better person than the next person. It's based upon God's love, mercy, and forgiveness in the person of Jesus Christ. That is why we're going to heaven. They leave out the fact that God is in the business of saving sinners. As terrible an attitude that Jonah had, that's one thing Jonah knew. Jonah knew that God was in the business of saving sinners. So if there's, if the only thing you know about the book of Jonah is that a whale swallowed some guy, learn it today. God is in the business of saving sinners of which we are one. The story of Jonah is a strange story, even aside from the fact that a, that a whale swallowed a man. One lesson, again, I want you to see from this book is that Jonah was a man that was very familiar with the fact that God is a God of love, mercy, and forgiveness. The sad part about it is Jonah didn't want to see God's love, mercy, and forgiveness extended extended to a certain group of people. That's one of the messages of the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah demonstrates God's mercy to wicked people when he spared the repentant Ninevites. But the book also shows God's long-suffering mercy when he continued to pursue after Jonah and work and interact in Jonah's life, even as rebellious and ornery and as a bad attitude as Jonah had. 
God continued to pursue and work in Jonah's life. God could have said, you know, okay, Jonah, you're going to flee that way. I'll find someone else that's going to go this way. But God went after Jonah and set him back on the right path through some pretty hard times. My focus today, my focus of my message today is on those first words of the book of Jonah. And if you watch this, the slideshow before the service this morning, you saw those verses up there, at least that first verse. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. The word of God came to Jonah. Bible teachers tell us that there's two types of revelation, and really the Bible presents this. There's what we call general revelation and special or specific revelation. General revelation is when you look out in the world and you see God's creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. Honestly, I cannot look up into the sky on a nice clear sky and see all those stars without having that verse come into my mind. The heavens declare the glory of God. I love getting out into the country where there's no light pollution and you can just see all those stars up there. They just sing of the glory of God. And when we look at trees, they cry to us the glory of God. They cry to us about the creator. That's general revelation. But the Bible also has special revelation. The Bible is special revelation. It teaches special revelation. What Jonah was receiving was special revelation. What we have in our hands today as the Word of God, the Old and New Testament, is special revelation. It's written down for us. How will you respond to God's special revelation to you? We see in the book of Jonah how Jonah responded to it. God said, go this way. What did Jonah do? He went the other way. How will you and I respond to God's special revelation to us? simple here in this passage. As you read verse 2, as I read it already, arise, go to Nineveh. What's the first word of verse 3? But. And but points out a contrast. It points out a contrast, and that's my first point. My first point is a contrasting response to the Word of God. That's what we see here. Here's what God says, and in contrast, but Jonah goes the other way. Verse, let's read verse 2, or verse 3 again. We read verse 2, excuse me, let's read verse 3. So God says to go to Nineveh, verse 3, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare. There, he found a ship going to Tarshish and paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go, unto them, go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah, God said, go this way. And in contrast, Jonah did something completely different. Jonah's response, what was in Jonah's mind when he went in complete contrast to the word of God? I think Jonah, in a way, we can see kind of that it fit together. What Jonah did kind of made sense when he was doing it. Because, hey, there's a ship there, right? There's a ship. I should be able to get into a ship. That ship is going to Tarshish, so that's, that's a viable option. I have enough money to pay what's required to be on that ship. They are carrying cargo on that ship, but apparently they have room for me. They have a nice place for me inside that ship to sleep. It all makes sense, except for one thing. What is that? It's in complete contrast to God's will for Jonah. It's funny how people can rationalize which Jonah probably did, rationalize their decision to do something in complete contrast to the will of God. Recently, I was listening to a kind of a question and answer show, and a question came in of a, 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 a kind of raising a scenario, which is going on in this person's life. And they said, my son, who's been married for three years and just had his second child 10 days ago, has come to us, his parents, and said, I've fallen out of love with my wife, and I've made a decision to divorce her. What should we do? This is the response of the parents. And the pastor gave some advice that was answering those questions, but one of the things he said was this. He said, hopefully you can convince your son that there's more to marriage than love. That's one thing. 
Marriage is about a keeping a covenant. It's a covenant relationship. And first and foremost, it's about keeping that covenant relationship. But he said this. He said, most of the time, when people make a decision to do something that goes so contrary to the word of God, they rationalize and convince themselves that it's the right thing to do. But yet, it remains. It's in contrast to the word of God. Jonah had convinced himself, there's a boat. They've got room for me. I've got money to get on the boat. They've got a place for me to sleep. It's going to be comfortable. I wonder if in his mind he even rationalized his reasoning. And there's other reasons why Jonah rationalized his reasons to go in the opposite direction of God, which we'll see as we get further into the book of Jonah. But I wonder if that's what he, what he did. We see here a nothing but, no matter how you rationalize it, no matter there's a ship, no matter there's reasons, no matter it's going a different direction, no matter you have the money to do it, it still stands. It's in contrast to the Word of God. It's a contrasting response. How do you and I respond to the Word of God? Number two, when Christians act and live in contrast to the Word of God, God will act in contrast to them. Be aware. I want you to notice a pattern here. In verse 1, what does it say? The word of God came. Verse 2, or verse 3, excuse me, but Jonah rose up and fled to Tarshish. And then what's it say in verse 4? What's the first word of verse 4? But. What is that but in contrast to? Is it in contrast to the word of God? No. It's in contrast to Jonah's contrast to the word of God. It's in contrast to Jonah's actions. God had something he wanted to accomplish. God says, Jonah, you are going to have an integral part in my accomplishing my will for the Ninevites. And Jonah said, no, God, I'm going to go the other direction. And God said, no, Jonah, I'm going to send a storm. God had something he wanted to accomplish. Jonah was the man that God had chose to do it. And guess what? God was going to get it done, whether Jonah liked it or not. A whole lot better if we would like the will of God. A whole lot better that we would find our joy and satisfaction in the word of God and in the will of God. God has saved you and I to accomplish his will for his glory, and he will get it done. Listen to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You were created. You are a new creature in Jesus Christ. You were created by God physically, and through salvation, you are a new creature in Jesus Christ. You are God's new creation, and you are for God's glory, honor, and pleasure. Revelation, that's, that's Revelation chapter 4, 11. Listen to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. As many as I love, this is in reference to the Laodicean church in Revelation, 14, Revelation chapter 3. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. If you are here this morning and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are a product of God's love. He loves you demonstrated in him saving you. Christ gave himself for the church. He loved the church and gave himself for it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6 says this, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked to him. For whom the Lord loves, he chases and scourges every son whom he receiveth. I'm not omniscient. Neither are you. God is. I don't know why God is doing what he's doing in your life or sometimes my life. I don't know why. I don't know it all the time. But listen, if something like what Jonah's going to go through, as we're going to see in this passage, something like that happens at some level or another, one question we ought to ask ourselves, am I doing something in contrary to the will of God? Am I acting, living, in a direction in contrast to God's will? Because if I am, there's no doubt. Now, that's not the reason always that some of these things happen. 
But if we are, there's no doubt that God is going to live and act in contrast to us. I'm reminded of a words of a wise Pharisee in Acts chapter 5. The Jewish leaders were getting together and working against the apostles, trying to squelch the gospel. And they said, you know, we're really going to stop these guys now. And the guy by the name of Gamaliel stood up and he said this. You, if this is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest haply we be found even to fight against God. There's a guy with some wisdom in the midst of that group. Christians, we ought to have that wisdom that we can't fight against God. How often do we try? Number three, our decision to flee from the will of God can and often does have an effect on those around us. Our decision to live and act in contrast or respond in contrast to the will of God can and does have an effect on those on the lives of those around us. We, saw, we see in this passage clearly how it has an effect on Jonah. Jonah's action, actions cause great potential harm to others. Let's look back in Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. Jonah 1, verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. I want to give you a little bit of a warning about the book of Jonah and other parts of the Bible like the book of Jonah. I think too often we relegate stories like Jonah to Sunday school for kids and childlike stories. And we get this kind of sentimental, swappy kind of Bible teaching that, you know, Jonah gets thrown over and this really cool talking whale comes and swallows him up. Hey, Jonah, and Jonah's down there just kind of having a good old time in the whale. You know, that is not the way to read this book of the Bible. This was, physically speaking here, an unbelievable traumatic event in the lives of these people. It says there, the ship was like to be broken. These guys were crying out to their gods, their false gods. They were in dire straits. They were in a, in, in a traumatic situation. They were crying out. These guys were not first-time sailors. They're experienced sailors. And what did they do? They started throwing the wares and the cargo overboard. You're desperate as a sailor when you do that. That is a last-ditch effort of survival. This was an event in the lives of these sailors and, of course, in the life of Jonah that they would not soon forget. It was real trauma that Jonah brought into their lives. You know, I've had some physical events in my life that I have not forgotten. One time, I, I, as a kid, maybe I didn't really, but I thought I was going to drown. I went to the ocean. My dad and I always body surfed in the ocean. We looked up and down the beach. Nobody was swimming. So we decided we're going in. We're tough guys. We're going to go in. And I got uh, stuck in undertow and rip current like I'd never gotten before. And boy, you're tired. I just thought I was going to drown. And finally, somehow I ended up on the shore, got washed up, coughing, sputtering. And in my mind, I have never forgotten that experience. That was a traumatic experience. I've come upon two deceased people in my life. I've never forgotten that. That was a traumatic experience. I got caught up in a road rage situation where a guy, two guys, thought my car was the other car, and it wasn't. But the other car turned off just in time, and I come up behind him, and both those guys got out of the car. I thought me, Steve Bartle and I, I thought we were going to die that day. I, I, I really did. I, was, I still can picture the faces of those guys. I thought we were going to die. That was, and maybe you've had experiences like that where you've had such a traumatic experience in your life that it's kind of indelibly written upon your minds. 
These guys never forgot this day, I guarantee it. And it was a traumatic event. And who brought that traumatic event into their lives? But Jonah. Jonah, you've caused us a big problem this day. We just threw away all the car, girl. We're not going to make any money on this trip. And whoever owns this boat is going to be really unhappy with us that we threw away everything. We almost lost the ship. It's probably damaged. We almost died today. All because of you, Jonah, decided to run from your God, the God of heaven. Our disobedience can cause spiritual trauma. You know, a lot of times we're concerned about the physical in people's lives and in our own lives. But, and, and we're concerned about being safe kind of spiritually, I mean physically. But we need to realize that we can cause great spiritual trauma and harm in people's lives because we're way too carnal. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, 21 says this. Let me read it. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart also. And just simply to say this here is we need to realize the great good we can do for eternity by focusing on doing the will of God for our lives. And we need to realize the great potential spiritual harm that we can cause in the lives of our own life, our own family's lives, the lives of others, the lives of our fellow church members when we go in contrast to the will of God. Fourthly, lastly this morning, Jonah. Who was Jonah? He was the prophet. We got a book in the Bible named after him. He's a prophet of God. But this demonstrates Jonah's spiritual condition at this point in time. Living in contrast, acting in contrast to the will of God is Jonah had to learn a lesson from unbelieving sailors that day. He had to learn a lesson from unbelieving sailors. Where was Jonah when all this storm was going on? He was down asleep in the boat. Do we have another example of someone down asleep in a boat? Who was that? Jesus. It's a big difference between Jesus and Jonah. Jesus is resting in the will of God. Jonah is sleeping from the will of God. He's resting from the will of God. A big, huge difference. We don't need to rest from the will of God. We don't need to take a break or a vacation away from the will of God. We need to live and rest and enjoy and be satisfied in the will of God. That was a big difference. Look at chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. Let's read verses 8 through 10 of chapter 1. It says, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? And what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. I fear Jehovah God, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So these guys were praying to the God of the sea. They were praying to the God of the storms. They were praying to the God of the sky. They were praying to the God of the land to get them safety to the land. And then they come to Jonas, Jonah and they say, what's going on here? How come this is happening to us? And he says, I'm a man of Jehovah God, the God of heaven who created everything. Jonah should have known better. It's amazing sometimes the knowledge of spiritual things that Christians have. I've met some really knowledgeable Christians that are living in contrast to the will of God. You've met people like that. They know the things of the Bible, but they live in contrast to them. And that was going on with Jonah. And you know what? It's funny how these lost guys, lost sailors, were shocked at that. They were shocked at the fact that Jonah was doing something that caused so much harm by living in contrast to God. 
Christians that live in contrast to the will of God are a joke to unbelievers. They're a joke to unbelievers. It's interesting, too, which I won't get into it today for sake of time, that these sailors no longer called upon their false gods. They began to call upon Jehovah. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know whether they added one more God to their list of gods or if they turned away from those gods, I hope to think, and they turned to Jehovah. They made vows to Jehovah God. They sacrificed to Jehovah God, if you read the rest of the chapter. And the moment, and they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to throw Jonah overboard, did they? They even asked God kind of forgiveness in advance (laughs) for doing it. And they threw Jonah overboard and Jonah went down into the sea And immediately the sea was calmed. Again, another contrast there with Jesus. Jesus just had to say, peace, be still. The seas were calm. He stayed in the boat. Jonah had to be thrown over the boat to get the seas calm because he was out of God's will. Big contrast there. So let me close with a couple of things. Really simply, the thing to take away this morning is God told Jonah to do this, and Jonah did that. Something completely different. You can jump ahead in the book of Jonah. And beginning of Jonah, God says, do this. Jonah does this. Real simple question. Who wins? God wins. A little bit better. A whole lot better if Jonah would have just did all this on God's team (laughs) instead of kind of being on the enemy's team a little bit. Second thing, attitude towards the word of God. What is your attitude towards God reveal, God's revealed will for you from the word of God? I'd love to be able to tell you something different, but I'll, I'll tell you this by asking questions. What kind of attitude did Jonah have toward the will of God in the beginning of book of Jonah? Good or bad? Bad. I think we'd have a vote. It, was bad. it would be bad. Bad would win. We're not, we can't do it right now, but you can do it. And many of you probably have. Read through the book of Jonah. The end of the book of Jonah, what kind of attitude did Jonah have toward the will of God? Good or bad? Bad. Bad. Bad attitude toward the will of God. It's a shame that we have a lot of Christians, and sometimes I is one, that have a bad attitude towards God's revealed will. Where does it start? It starts when we want to live and act in contrast with the will of God. Something else I'd like to point out from this passage as we close. When we choose to live in contrast to God's will, it leads to a downward kind of spiral. Down, that's the title of the message this morning. Down, 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 down. If you look at verse 1, or excuse me, verse 3, Jonah went down to Joppa. Interesting there that he went down to Joppa. I mean, that's just the direction that it was, and he went down to Joppa. And then, verse 5, Jonah went down into the ship. Why did did Jonah go down, down? Well, the answer to that is at the end of verse 3, he was running from the presence of the Lord. He was running from the presence of the Lord. In verse 15, Jonah got tossed overboard, so you could say he went down even further. He was no longer in the bottom of the ship. He was in the water. And chapter 2, just look ahead to chapter 2 just for a second, verse 6. He says, I went down to the bottom of the mountains. That's probably the mountains down in the depth of the ocean. Jonah's being carried down inside that whale, down to the depths of the ocean. You don't get much further down than that, do you? When you live, act, think, walk in contrast to God's will, it's down, down, down. And Christians, sometimes God might have to take you so far down that there's no other place to look but what? Up. And we'll look in chapter 2 that Jonah does look up. There was a reason why I had Bob read Psalm 3 because there's a quote in Psalm 3, or Jonah quotes from Psalm 3, in the book of Jonah, and maybe another psalm as well. Let me ask that question again. What is your attitude towards the Word of God? I kind of challenged a Sunday school class this morning about 
renewing your commitment or continuing your commitment, maybe increasing your commitment to the Word of God in 2018, committing yourself to reading it, to praying over it, studying it, memorizing it. And what is your attitude toward the Word of God? How do you respond to God's Word and God's will for your life? Are you like a Jonah? Kind of rationalizes why I can go the other direction? My name is Pastor Ron Kenny, and I want to thank you for joining us for this broadcast of Fellowship Baptist Church. We are located on 41 North Bedford Road in the Urbandale section of Battle Creek. The times of our services are Sunday school at 10 a.m., Sunday morning worship service at 11 a.m., and Sunday evening services at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evening services at 7 p.m. We have a potluck supper on every fourth Sunday with no evening service on that particular Sunday. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and you're always welcome at Fellowship Baptist Church. Access Vision, your voice, your community.